My name is Eva Cashton, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Amherst. And we're very pleased uh, to be co-sponsoring this forum tonight with the Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art, which is a national educational center dedicated to the enjoyment and study of picture books for all audiences. And I want to also thank Amherst Media for being here to record this meeting. Our topic tonight is art and music education in a time of budget cuts. And we will have several speakers. And uh, I will introduce the speakers in the order in which they will uh, participate. First, we will have Alexandra Kennedy, who is the executive director of the Eric Carl Museum. And uh, before she became uh, the executive director here, she launched Family Fun Magazine, Wonder Time Magazine, and several other publications and brand extensions from Disney Publishing worldwide, where she served as vice president and editorial director. Our second speaker will be our Senator Stan Rosenberg who has um, served as our state senator for a number of years. And in 2003, in fact, he was named President Pro Tem of the Massachusetts Senate, becoming the first senator in state history to hold this leadership position. When I asked him exactly what that is, he said, it's something like being vice president. <laughs> assistant majority leader, and he was also the first Western Massachusetts legislator to chair the Senate Committee on Ways and Means. He continues to maintain a leadership role affecting education, the environment, health care, and human services. A third speaker would be Terry Magner, who has been teaching art at the Fort River Elementary School in Amherst for 34 years. She balances her time between her own work as a mixed media artist and an art teacher and curriculum developer. Most recently, she designed an integrated art and science curriculum for the National Science Foundation <clears throat> through the UMass Polymer Science and Engineering Outreach Program. So I hope she will tell us something about this combination of art and science. Our fourth speaker is Moema Lacerdo Furtado, who um, holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Design and Environmental Analysis from Cornell University and a Master's of Fine Arts degree in Painting from University of Wisconsin. Uh, she had taught art at the University of Tennessee and she moved to Amherst last summer and is Director of Education and Engagement for the UMass Fine Arts Center. And then we will turn a little bit more to music. Uh, Mr. David Raynan will speak. He has taught at the Amherst Regional Schools for 31 years. During that time, he acted as Director of Choral Activities at the Amherst Regional uh, Junior High and Middle School, taught classes at both the Amherst Regional High School and the Amherst Regional High School Alternative Programs at Amherst. He spent 16 years as the department head for Performing Arts Department and the K-12 Music Coordinator for the Amherst Schools. And last will be uh, Rick Hood, uh, who is a graduate of Brown and MIT. He moved to Amherst in 2002, and he is currently chair of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. So, thank you, and we will start with Alexandra Kenny. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Carl. 
Um, we're grateful to the League of Women Voters for uh, putting this together tonight uh, on such an important topic. So let me get my presentation open here. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, the Air Carl and why museum and why we're here. And then I'm going to um, talk a little specifically about our education approach and um, some of the things we see ahead for the future. There we go. So in no surprise, our story uh, begins with Eric Carl. He was trained as a graphic designer and found his way very happily to picture books in the mid-60s. Uh, he is still best known for The Very Hungry Caterpillar, which he created in 1969, and which has sold more than three, 30 million copies. Uh, I heard a statistic once that a copy sells somewhere every 30 seconds in the world. Though Eric and his wife Barbara now split their time between North Carolina and Florida, they lived for many years in Northampton and are very devoted to our region. Eric has always had a deeply held belief that illustration is a fine art form. For fun, here you are looking at works by, a work by Chris Van Allsburg, the wonderful picture book artist, and Caspar David Friedrich, the 19th century German landscape painter, <coughs> who helps to uh, illustrate uh, Eric's feelings on this topic. Eric's success with Caterpillar led him and his wife Barbara, an educator, to Japan. Caterpillar is as popular there as it is here in the U.S. There they discovered many art museums devoted solely to picture books. In the minds of the Japanese, there was no distinction between illustration and fine art. Eric and Bobby were smitten. They decided to create the first full-scale picture book art museum in the U.S., what Eric often refers to as the house that the Caterpillar built. With the help of educators, artists, authors, and publishers, Eric and Bobby drew up a plan. Here is our first mission statement, one that still holds well today. I'm going to try not to read it. It's annoying when people read things up there. In 2001, a year before the museum opened, Eric traveled to Pistoia, Italy, where educators were exhibiting his work. This discovery of the Reggio-inspired early childhood programs helped shape Eric's ideas about his museum. He loved the attention to the arts, the respect for children's aesthetics, and the open-ended approach to letting children explore their ideas. So it's not surprising to note that since 2004, the museum has been in partnership with educators in Reggio and Pistoia, sponsoring teacher institutes and seminars. Our head of development, uh, excuse me, our head of education, Rosemary Agolia, is in Pistoia right now, leading 22 educators from America on a tour. Lucky Rosemary. Mm -hmm. On November 22, 2002, the Carl opened its doors with the help of the architects from Jester Pope Fraser. That's Jester, as in Norton, as in the Phantom Toll Booth. Um, Eric had created a space designed with great flexibility and one that reflected his aesthetic: clean lines, lots of white space, bold color. At the center of it all was the picture book art, the art we all love first. Eric and Bobby hoped the Carl would be a welcoming place for book and art lovers, teachers, librarians, and most of all, families. It was a new concept, not a children's museum, but an art museum that welcomes children. In the eight years that have followed, we've welcomed about 50,000 people a year, including roughly 4,000 school children and 1,000 teachers who have come here for our professional development courses. The museum encourages guests to experience picture books in all different ways. They can take in original works in our three galleries. We've exhibited Maurice Sendak, William Steig, Ashley Bryan, Arnold LaBelle, to name a few. Our reading library has 4,500 picture books shelved by artists that guests can help themselves to. And in our art studio, which Kathy knows well, inspired by those Italian ateliers, guests can explore materials and play with their own visual ideas, often inspired by the artists whose work is exhibited in the galleries. And then, of course, there's this auditorium, where we have children's theater, music and film, as well as artist, author, and educator lectures for adults. The museum quickly became an important place, not just for school groups, but for teachers and librarians those who wore their passion for picture books on their sleeves. They came to see the original art, meet artists and authors, and learn about how these books came to be. That's Tommy DePaula on the right. He exhibited here last year. So in our own babyhood, we set about putting the pieces together to better define our educational approach and the ways we might engage children in art and support their development of literacy. 
We were convinced that picture books, that perfect blend of art, storytelling, and time shared between grown-up and child, held the key. We started with art, with art, asking ourselves, what does it mean to think about art? We considered the importance of careful observation, the documentation of our visitors' experiences, and the need to listen to our audience. However, there was one problem. It's hard to tell what people are thinking about when they look at art. They don't say much. The traditional docent tours fill the void by having an expert tell you what to look at and how to think about it. <laughs> that wasn't going to work with our audiences. We wanted to give them the tools to appreciate and engage with art. We wanted our visitors to understand that you cannot flunk museum going. We implemented a program based on the visual thinking strategies developed by Philip Yenawine and Abigail Housen at Harvard. In a nutshell, it can best be described as having a facilitated discussion about a work of art. It encourages the viewer to make meaning of what they see and clearly shares some of the underlying principles with the Reggio approach. In our library, we focused on reading books. By combining some of the features of the visual thinking strategies in Reggio Emilia, we developed the whole book approach, an interactive reading session in which children explore pictures, text, and design, a wonderful opportunity to use both their creative and critical thinking skills. It's a very different experience when you read with and not just to children. In our art studio, we set out to create a place for learning. In their book, Beautiful Stuff, educators Kathy Topal and Leila Gandini, both dear friends to the Carl, set up art studio spaces for children. The studio space is not an isolated space where artistic things happen. It's a laboratory for thinking. It's a place to see that thinking can be expressed through materials. There is something for everyone there, whether you're a teacher or librarian wanting to browse resources and documentation, a young child who moves from one activity to another, or you're someone who likes to study books and objects to get ideas. And if you can see it and reach it, you can touch it. One of our ongoing jobs is, into, is to inspire our guests with materials. It's the job of the participant to decide how to use the material. We put a variety of interesting objects around the room for people to draw from. We also display samples of our own sketchbooks and copies of pages from the sketchbooks of a variety of artists. When we offer broad entry points and multiple ways to get ideas and make connections, the results are personal and unique. We get windows into people's interests and ways of thinking. In this class, for example, our day started with each student selecting a picture book of interest to them to inspire drawings with graphite on paper and with permanent marking on acetate. So the drawings could be blended by projecting and tracing them onto a larger piece of paper. We are great believers that a good education is one which exposes children to art, art viewing, art making, and art discussion. We believe in art education and just as important, education through the arts. Art encourages children to be both creative and critical thinkers, skills critical for them no matter what they decide to do when they grow up. So in looking toward the future, as the arts are cut at school, we see more and more how critical it is that we provide our resources to teachers and students. Every year we see teachers increasingly challenged to bring children to the museum. It's hard to find the time when they are preparing kids for standardized tests. There are increasing regulations they need to follow, like school nurses on the buses. And most of all, it is harder and harder for them to raise the money for the bus. And yet museums like the Carl are the perfect place to immerse children in art. So what do we do? We appeal to donors and apply for grants to secure transportation front funds up front with some good results, though we all know how tough it is to, uh, to secure grants, especially now. We send our greatest resource, our educators and the picture books themselves, into the schools if you can't bring Moses to the mountain. And we build the next generation of picture book advocates through our Simmons graduate program where if you can, you can come to the Carl and get an MFA in children's writing or an MA in children's literature through Simmons. Um, we also do it through a course we just taught at Hampshire next door, that's who these kids are here, encouraging students to develop art programs for children. And we do it through the dozens of internships we offer every year. 
We make the museum a welcoming place for educators and offer professional development workshops and lectures hoping to help teachers make the integration of art a little easier. And we offer free passes to low-income families so they can um, more easily take advantage of what we have to offer. What we need to do next is to find more and better ways to help teachers integrate art into their curriculum so that even with all the restrictions they have, restrictions of time and money, every child can grow up with a chance to learn through art. It will need to include doing diligent assessments of our progress along the way, and it's a challenge we're excited by and committed to. So many thanks, and looking forward to seeing you um, and uh, hearing what uh, the other panelists have to say. So thank you. Legislator, therefore I have no PowerPoint. <laughs> and um, I was asked to address the uh, subject of arts education and the uh, state budget. And that could be an extremely short speech if I stick to that because the answer is there is none. There is no uh, special uh, allocation or appropriation or line item that is targeted specifically at arts education. We do have a state arts agency, and that uh, agency does receive some funds, and in the 1980s, it was actually the highest per capita arts budget in the country at about $25 million, but um, in the uh, 1990s, uh, Mr. Finner and a name familiar to league members at least, um, he basically all but eliminated the state arts agency and it went all the way down to $3 million, and has since rebuilt, and. I don't have the exact number in my head right now. Uh, feel free to correct me if anyone has a better number, but I'm remembering it's in the 12 to $14 million range at this point, which is about half of where it was uh, some 20 years ago when it was at the, at the height. Um, since then, we have created a couple of new things in, in arts-related funding, which only tangentially uh, can assist in, um, in, in this realm. And, it's, and it doesn't actually help uh, arts education in public schools, but we have created a cultural facilities program that provides capital grants to organizations that um, need to create or improve physical facilities to uh, present art and uh, in all of its forms. And um, some of the uh, arts uh, education oriented organizations uh, have been uh, successful in getting grants from the organization because if you can show some connection to tourism, uh, you can apply for this grant because it's supposed to help improve physical facilities so that people can um, attract people from out of state to come and visit the Commonwealth. And so, for example, if people were driving down here from uh, any of the uh, surrounding states to bring their child here for a day of uh, activities uh, because that might bring some people in from out of state, a facility of this sort. Um, had it uh, been available at the time, could have applied. It wasn't available at the time. Um, and maybe someday there'll be other improvements you're going to want to make here, or expansions, and if that program is still there, you'd be able to. But that's really the only um, even tangential uh, piece that I can um, point to because all of the rest of the education funding is by formula and the formula basically uh, drives uh, the amount of money that's going to go to each city and town and, and tries to speak to what does it cost to educate a child in various types of schools from uh, urban uh, to suburban to rural, uh, but it doesn't um, uh, earmark or set aside any particular piece for arts education. And so it's really left to local school boards to decide where it fits in their priority scheme. And now recently, we've started a new initiative that I'd like to tell you about because it, although it's, it's not a money piece at this point, it is a uh, potential game changer as relates to uh, arts and arts education and education in general because uh, Massachusetts, uh, as part of an economic development bill, believe it or not, uh, put in place a piece of legislation that I and several others created, 
which uh, would have the uh, Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education set up a commission for the purpose of creating a creativity index. And the concept is that we want to identify the, uh, the skill sets and the approaches to developing skills in young people that um, relate to the arts, creativity and communication and teamwork and the kinds of things that people do uh, if they're playing in, a, in an ensemble or if they're working in a studio on their own piece. The range of skills and the way um, children and young people uh, interact with uh, arts and arts material and, um, and then the skills that get developed as a result of that. And then identifying the best practices for integrating and incorporating arts into the curriculum, not only as a silo within a school system, but cross-cutting interdisciplinary with other uh, subject matter, and uh, trying to identify um, the ways that uh, arts are used and can be used to enhance um, the uh, capacity of young people. And what generated this initiative was actually the fact that we've spent the last roughly 20 years, MCAS being sort of the, the lightning rod for this uh, process, was using standardized testing to determine whether young people have mastered the basics so that they are employable and they can participate actively in, in, uh, and, and engage in society in general. And um, the very people who created that movement, which is the business community, have now said, well, you know, uh, Massachusetts seems to have done pretty well on this, and we're now leading the nation in terms of the quality of public education, and we're getting better and better and better. But we've just noticed that we're now finding that the employees that we need to hire need to be increasingly creative. They have to increasingly be able to work with others. And they, we need innovation. And innovation it doesn't come just from the reading, writing, and arithmetic. And so it is the business community that basically calling for our public schools to figure out how to put this back into the curriculum, back into uh, education, public education, that uh, got us thinking about this concept of the um, creativity index. So, um, the next uh, five to ten years, hopefully we'll go through a process of figuring this out, and as I say, nobody's done this as an organized policy matter. There are academics who have studied this, there are individual teachers who are passionately committed to this idea, but it's not organized as a policy uh, effort. It's just their passion, their understanding, their own uh, initiative, their own innovation uh, that's bringing this. But now we're going to be trying as a policy matter and be the first in the country trying to do this to figure out what we need to do as a state policy matter to see this integrated into our, um, into our curriculum, into the curriculum of the schools and into uh, policy. And this is extremely important. Um, some of you have heard me, and I'll, I'll finish in, in hopefully another two minutes here. Um, some of you have heard me you know, talk about that uh, famous quote from Mr. Adams to his wife Abigail, saying, I have to study uh, war and politics so that my sons can study math and science so that their sons and daughters can study music and poetry and art, etc. And so he was president uh, uh, Adams basically saying, in, as this country was being founded, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it is critical that we provide for the security of the country. The job isn't done until you can provide for the economic security and for people to be able to make a living and put clothes on their backs and have a home, etc. But the job isn't done until, in the society, people can understand and reflect upon their culture and who they are, what their history is, where they're going, and uh, to, if you will, self-actualize through the arts and humanities. And um, so now, you know, some 300 years later, we're finally starting as a country to begin to recognize and understand this. And as a self-governing people, you cannot have a self-governing society that can do the job properly 
if people cannot communicate with each other, if they can't understand and relate to other people's points of view, if they can't go into a room, see the same problem from different angles, and potentially come up with different ideas and different ways of addressing and solving it. And that's what artists do. They share their view of their world, of their experience in the world, and they present it to us in forms from, from visual arts to music to dance to poetry, etc. And then it's our job as the receiver to reflect on that experience and see if we agree, if we get it, if it makes sense to us, and to challenge it or to agree with it and trying to help shape the world with that uh, newfound way of communicating it and seeing it and understanding it. And so a self-governing people needs to have this capacity. And our country is still relatively young compared to our friends in, in uh, Europe and Asia uh, who understood this a long time ago and have incorporated culture uh, into their societies in a much more fundamental way than we have. We still see it, many people still see it as a frill. And if you want to buy it, go buy it. If you're rich and you want to pay for it, go rip, go pay for it. But um, what these other countries have figured out is it isn't just utilitarian, it isn't just about making a pretty space and having something to put on that wall. It's really about fundamentally much, much more than that. And we are finally beginning as a nation to start to get it. It's still under attack, as we can see from our friends in Washington. And I'll call them friends because I want to be civil. Um, so, but um, there is there is a, a movement afoot. It's at the grassroots level, and it's the teachers and the neighbors and the, and the folks who really understand this, and uh, organizations like this, like the uh, League, who understand that um, uh, engaging people in public process and in public discussion and public action. Uh, is fundamental to improving and changing our society. And the arts can be a powerful tool and a powerful um, opportunity to try to help do this. And so I'm glad that the League is uh, sponsoring this forum. And I thank all of you for coming here this evening. And I look forward to the comments of my uh, co-panelists. I may not be able to stay quite as long as everyone else. Please forgive me, but uh, I will stay for as long as I can. Thank you. teacher in the Amherst Public Schools since well before the age of MCAS and time on learning and schools across the state tried to accommodate all of the new mandates, budgets were continuously reduced and the arts have been diminished and in some instances eliminated in some grade levels. While budgets are still very much constrained, the tide may be turning and the pendulum may be swinging and I am hopeful. Well, I'm hopeful. Let's take a look at this. While I'm smiling and hopeful. <laughs> In Amherst, elementary art provides an essential foundation for self-expression, critical thinking, sustained effort, equity, and excellence. With differentiated instruction always, every student, kindergarten through six, has hands-on activities while learning about global art history and contemporary art, all in about two and a half hours of art class per month. Yeah. Now more than ever, we need to step up and reevaluate and reconfigure the role of arts education in our schools for the future and talk about whole art programs, not just art classes. I'd like to cite some of my reasons to support this. Now more than ever, in our intensely visual world, 
art and visual literacy are essential for all learners. For a large percentage of our school population, the only fine art exposure, vocabulary, learning, and insight comes from school art. It is empowering for students to know the names of artists, paintings, styles, and techniques. The Mona Lisa herself has been used in large-scale advertising more than any other piece of art. And when children know and recognize these images, they feel smart and capable. Visual literacy gives our students access to a large part of the culture of our world in the 21st century. Without art programs, the acquisition of visual art experience and knowledge is left up to families. Without art education, the world may appear the same, stimulating visually, but true access is denied. And the door must be opened in elementary school. High school and college students' schedules rarely allow for art electives. Former students have repeatedly made it a point of returning to me, high school students, telling me that elementary art learning helped them pass the high school AP history exam because they learned some art history in elementary school. And many more of my former students engaged in vastly varied professions and careers have shared with me that when they walk through an art museum anywhere in the world, or even just Google one to be there, they realize it was their elementary art learning that helped them feel confident and able to engage in art conversations. Visual literacy is more essential now than ever. And, now more than ever, we need to spark creative thinking in our schools. From President Obama and the National Science Foundation, Stan Rosenberg and Deval Patrick, we are hearing the cries for divergent thinking and interdisciplinary connections as a foundation for lifelong learning and inquiry. It is the vision for our future and our future leaders. Capitalizing on creative thought with creative connections is a big part of what we need to consider while we reevaluate and reconfigure the role of arts education in our schools. I've seen this creative spark in action. For the last year, I have been working closely with the Polymer Science and Engineering Department at UMass through their outreach program. They provided me with the visuals for the development of a K through six art and science curriculum last year. From the very start, the conversations with students ages 5 through 12 about what art is and what science is were incredible. Students immediately found overlaps, and that bit of insight gave them increased confidence in both and interest in both subject areas. You're looking at a six foot four microscope sculpture that my students made last year, engineered architecturally like the ICA, a little math involved, or a lot of math. The art and science lessons encourage brand new kinds of problem solving and innovative thinking. I saw students blossom in both areas. Those who approach art cautiously stood tall when science entered the mix, and vice versa. Our students who are such digital natives think that the best visuals are only in Xbox games and that their future must be in designing these games. <laughs> but seeing how visually exciting science can be and is quickly broadened their scope. Sparks were flying and they could see themselves taking risks and trying things in art, science, and math. They wanted to know more and more. Another spark recently was the Sala Witt exhibit at Mass MoCA, which is still there till 2025. That provided an opportunity for me to develop some K-6 math and art curriculum. Sala Witt's painting of isometric cubes became the basis for a lesson for sixth graders to measure, then draw and paint cubes with various angles. With protractors in hand, discussions about angles took place while students were mixing colors and painting their cubes. They were encouraged to remember to visualize these angles while taking their math MCAS tests. For some students, this is key. Again, capitalizing on creative thought 
with creative connections is a big part of what we need to consider when we reevaluate and reconfigure the role of arts education in our schools. So truly it is an exciting time for art educators. As a wise administrator once said to me, perhaps it should be stated that the pendulum is circling rather than swinging, connecting all sides of our work as educators. So we need to move forward with the intent of educating the whole child and honing their skills, their creative skills, with new direction and energy. Talking about reviewing, renewing, and maintaining strong arts education programs. Thank you. We are committed to provide educational access programs that deepen the appreciation, understanding, and acknowledge of the arts. Entire programs were lost to budget cuts. The New World Theatre program, an innovative contemporary theatre for artists of color that after 30 years was not able to survive. This program engaged professional artists, youth communities, scholars, and community activists in civic dialogue and artistic creation, creating forums for intergenerational, interracial, and cross-cultural dialogues in community and in, in university settings. Project 2050 was an intensive 10-day summer retreat that culminated with an exciting performance created and performed by the youth Residential arts program showcase new and experimental works within the residential hall system was also cut. This program offers arts and crafts class such as dance, poetry, improvisation, etc. The UMass Fine Arts Center was founded in 1975. The Fine Arts Center is a collection of programs, each offering a specific performance and exhibitions. Usually, we associate the Fine Arts Center with the Fine Arts Center building. Uh, the Fine Arts Center building, we have the Fine Arts Center Concert Hall. It holds 1,980 seats. The Fine Arts Center Benzanson Hall with approximately 220 seats. But the Fine Arts Center organization is much more. Often, Fine Arts Center events are also held at UMass Boca Auditorium at the Stockbridge Hall. The Fine Arts Center is also in charge of the recently <coughs> renamed and renovated University Museum of Contemporary Art. Located at the Fine Arts Center building, it is unique in our region with its focus on contemporary national and international art. This museum organizes and hosts exhibitions of contemporary art in all media and maintains a permanent collection with an emphasis of work on paper, like drawings, uh, prints, and photographs. <clears throat> Approximately 2,600 objects are part of this collection. The collection study room also is available for classes and open to the public by appointment. Until May 1st, the works of David Goldblatt, a well-known South African artist photographer, is on exhibition. This exhibit is an example of the University Museum goal to be able to produce cross-disciplinary exhibition. We have Hampton and Central Galleries are located in UMass student residential areas. They showcase students' artwork and expose students to contemporary art. In Augusta Savage Gallery at the New African House that, uh, for visual arts and performance by people of color. 
The Fine Arts Center offers work study opportunities also to our students in a variety of areas. During our 2009-2010 season, 100 students gained valuable work experience in uh, backstage production, management, box office and marketing and development. Our Global Arts Performance Series for elementary and middle school students and teachers features the best in national and international performing arts center events. These performances are often accompanied by in-school workshops, artist visits, and study guides and advanced material for teachers. Performances are carefully select to meet the highest artistic standards while complementing school curriculum. Mariachi Los Camperos de Maticano and Fila Denko will perform a matinee for schools. 476 students from the Iron Middle and High Schools and 125 students from Williamston School attend three cups of tea. Nine five students from Williamston attend the artist workshop. The Shangri-La Chinese acrobats offer two matinees for schools. 2,425 students attended. 1,399 attended the main performance. With a grant from Mass Mutual, we are able to bring 507 students from the Springfield schools to attend the morning performance. A grant from Mass Mutual also provides 10 tickets to Springfield and Pioneer Valley Chinese language teachers to participate in the Fine Arts Bus Tour to the Peabody Essex Museum to see the Emperor's Private Paradise exhibit. Yazuko Yokoshi Tyler Tyler was co-presented with the Five College Dance Department, allowing Japanese artists to have access to dance studio in the Five Colleges. Master class were offered with Kabuki dancers and Yazuko Yokoshi at UMass. And Gods and Demons, Hamayana in Katakali Dance Theater, a spectacular combination of drama, dance, music and ritual present a free performance and makeup costume workshop. With the money raised through our annual gala event and the grant proposals award to our programmers, we are able to fund residencies, workshops and much more. Gala proceeds since 2008 provide funds for 17 artist residencies. These residencies not only enhance academically our campus, but also enhance public school curricula, help to inspire students and faculty. Since 2008, of the 8,000 people served through arts and education activities funded through the Fahrenheit Center Gala, 5,000 are elementary, secondary, and college students. We face big challenges during these difficult economic times. Few schools are able to take advantage of global arts programs. Without the critical mass of spectators, programs are at risk. The long-standing practice of including outreach educational activity as part of artists' contracts has changed. Now artists keep fees static but charge for additional activities. Major dance groups are asked over 1,500 for one residency. Center Series is another program, Solos and Duos and Magic Triangle, a jazz series that focus on intimate music experience. I will give you some examples of Center Series outreach. Members of La Lovitch Dance Company offer a mass class at UMass in Smith. Lionel Luke Trio perform and held a discussion session at the Pioneer Valley Performing Arts Center High School in South Hadley held a jazz theory and improvement, improved class at Amherst College, and a lecture demonstration at the Community Music School of Springfield. He also offered a master class and an interview for journalist student at UMass. Ballet Folklorico da Bahia performed a matinee for schools. In Cantus, all is calm, singers and actors gave a presentation at Lumos in South Hadley, Actors also gave a talk for a theater honor class at UMass. Cedar Lake Ballet Artist Director, director presents a master class at Smith College 
He also gave a pre performance lecture at UMass. In partnership with the Jewish community of Amherst, the Fine Arts Center is bringing to you UMass Galita Dashti and Diva on March 24. An all female powerhouse assembling performed traditional and original Middle Eastern Jewish songs. Galit will be a scholarly residence at JCA Friday, March the 25th. And Red Barak, a Brooklyn based band, will present two workshops one for Big Brothers and Big Sisters in Springfield, and the other for a disadvantaged youth service in lockdown facilities in Westfield. Cirque Mechanics in Boomtown will perform a matinee for schools. We four celebrate John Paul Train High School Jazz Festival. It's a day long of high school band competition at Boca Auditorium. Culminating the evening with performance by professionals as musicians, the band that win the competition will be the opening act for the evening performance. The Education Access Department is dedicated to promoting the educational programs of the entire Fine Arts Center. The department itself is comprising three distinct educational programs. Jazz in July, an extensive two weeks program in July focused on joining participants with jazz artists. Musicians from surrounding communities and around the world get together at UMass for this exciting program. Jazz in July is centered on teaching improvisation and jazz styles while we work to enrich the total music experience of the participants. High school, college, adult participation between the age 16 to 22. We ha they have combined lectures, master class, jazz se jam sessions, and performance. The Lively Arts, an arts appreciation course offered each semester and open to UMass students, Greenfield Community College, and members of the community through continued education. In the live arts, students meet guest artists, attend performance and exhibitions, and learn the language and tools to understand and appreciate various art forms. UMass Arts Council provides grant support, financial resource, networking, and arts informative service to students' organization and academic departments. The council provides $8,000, $90,000 each year to over 70 campus organizations who request funds to support theater, dance, music, video, and film, poetry readings, visual arts exhibits on campus. In 2009-2010 season, 51 projects funded to the Arts Council engaged 2,000, more than 2,000 students in planning and production. The Arts Give Back campaign collects clothes, food, toys, and other items for area nonprofit organization. While we offer a lot of cultural diverse program at the Fine Arts Center, we also like to support those arts and cultural groups who provide access to the community where they live. I hope I was able to give you a general idea of what we do at the UMass Fine Arts Center and how we are managed to cope with this difficult economic time. It takes a village to be able to survive these times. We thank our ticket buyers, subscribers, donors, and sponsors for their support. We're taking a more careful approach now by our mission continues the same, to inspire, engage, and educate. If you haven't attended or brought your students, I hope we have some uh, teachers here, to find our center performance, I invite you to do so. Go to our website, finearchcenter.com slash schools, and you'll find information about the come artists and performers who may be available and appropriate for residency in your school. You can be added to our mailing list that announces the availability of such residencies when they arise. Thank you very much.
first thing I'm going to ask you to do, because you all have, have uh, been very, very kind, kindly sitting there, I'm going to ask you to stand up. <laughs>
So that's where, where I'm, uh, I'm going to come from. So I'm going to go back. Um, Senator Rosenberg spoke about um, funds that were around back in the early 1980s and in, into the 80s. And I can remember when I first started teaching her here back in, in the, the early 1980s. And um, I walked in and was hand handed a budget and uh, it, it was staggering. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a problem to go purchase this and to purchase that. And um, I was very impressed. And as the years went on, um, you know, things happened. And then we got to 1991, which was the first major drop that, that, that um, I can remember, where in 1991, every department at the secondary level received two pink slips. And um, we managed to get through that year. And that was kind of a downward slope. Um, we've, since that time, have, have been on a roller coaster ride. So how did, uh, how did we make it, as, as a performing arts department, make it through that? We did all kinds of things, and um, you, you have, have had to find very creative ways to finance what you wanted to do in your schools. So some of the things that, that we did when um, I was department head, and I'm going to split our program into three parts. Um, instruction, instructional supplies for, for the classroom program, instructional supplies for, for the choral program, instructional supplies for, for the instrumental program. The instrumental program is probably the most expensive, as you, as you, can, um, as you, as you can imagine. Um, to, to purchase new instruments is very, very expensive, as well as very, very needed. Um, instruments get bent, instruments need, need to be repaired. Um, when I had first become head, head of the Performing Arts Department, we could send um, a trumpet out at the end of the school year to get it cleaned, to get it, um, to, to get it serviced for the upcoming school year at a cost of about $35. That cost is now, I'd say approximately $225. And um, we're still renting those instruments for $50 a year. Um, so we're, we're already running behind schedule with that kind of stuff. So one of the things that we had tried doing a few years ago, um, which had, had worked for, for a time being, was when I would put in um, a budget request, I would put in the price of um, a used instrument and the price of a brand new instrument, hoping to get somewhere in the middle. And at that time, we were putting in budget re requests that um, for, for budget increases of about 5%, believe it or not, and then that dwindled down to 3%, and now we're, uh, I stepped down as department head three years ago. At that point, for about three or four years, it was just level, level funded. We, we weren't putting in budget increase requests. Um, so, so that's a program that for us, we then went to see, okay, we, we need new instruments. Is there grant funding? We were able to find some, but there, there's not a lot um, of it, but we were, we were able to find some. Believe it or not, there was, there was a grant program that I um, uh, discovered with the help of former Assistant Super Superintendent Ron Bell many years ago through the Army um, surplus list. The Army at that time, and right up until about, I want to say eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, came out with, with a surplus list every year. And, um, Ron somehow managed to get a hold of the list, and he would send it to me, and I would go through the list, and sure enough, 
every once in a while we would snag an instrument off of it. And we got a wonderful French horn one year for fifty dollars, brand new. And uh, so you would you would find little things like that. Um, and then one time we were able to establish a um, music music department uh, music department booster group. And that went on pretty strong for about three or four years, and that was a big help. And through, through the booster group, we purchased um, brand new chairs for, for the um, middle, middle school band room, orchestra room. Um, instead of, we had been for a number of years, we would get the hand-me-down metal folding chairs, and metal folding chairs as it is, as you can imagine, kind of get bent. And then if you imagine even hand-me-down ones. So we got these really nice, um, uh, real, really nice music chairs. But that was through, through a, um, a parent booster group. Um, the last couple of years, through the high, high, school, high school PTO group, we've been able to apply for many grants. And um, we, our high, high school choral program has, has purchased music with the use of that. Um, for the music program that um, I started at South Amherst campus three years ago, I've been able to, to purchase some, some materials with, with a mini grant through there. And then I wanted to try something new this year because the students at South Amherst um, aren't, aren't always able to take advantage of high school um, assemblies that, that, hap that uh, hap happen during the day. So I wanted to start a um, performing, artist, um, performing artist series at the school. So this year I decided to see if I could bring three, three performing artists into the South Amherst campus. And I approached um, Evelyn Harris to come into the school. Um, uh, a brand new group that perf has performed in the Northampton area, um, a classical string group called Darling Side, uh, which if you ever get to see them in Northampton, they're, they're really good. Uh, and then um, the a cappella group from um, Amherst, um, Amherst College, the, the Zumbayes. Z Zumbayes, I can never remember how, how to pronounce their name. Uh, anyway, so I was able to get all all three performers to come in through through a mini grant. Um, so that so that's what we've been doing as um, as a performing arts department, and so that's what as as I, as I talk to colleagues um, around the state, and it's interesting that we're we're here tonight. March is music in a, in our schools month, and in in. Um, in two weeks, I'll be going to the Mass Music Educators um, All-State Conference, and one of the one of the workshops I'll, I'll be attending is mu music advocacy in, in your community, and it, it's this 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 kind of a talk, um, and it will be interesting to hear what what other people are having to do in in their towns to get people to realize just how, how important it is to make sure that the arts um, aren't dying out, but, but that we find ways to make sure that they, that they still stay strong and alive and have, have funding, because it, it, it's, um, it's very important. Um, our, our students, um, are getting pulled in all, all kinds of directions, um, whether it's to, to private schools or it's to, to charter schools, just all, all you know, all ways. And uh, we have a very, very strong school system here, and um, and I, I would I would want to see our town and our school stay as as strong as they've been for the 31 years that I've been here and as well supported as they've, as they've been. So as you think back, and I'm gonna end by asking this if I could, who here at some point in their life played an instrument? If, if you could raise your hands. Take a look around, keep your hands up. 
Now, if you can keep your hands up, if it was a school instrument and you played in some kind of ensemble in your school, could you keep your hands up? So still, still some, some hands up. Okay. And how many people took part in an art program in your schools as kids? So a lot of hands are still up. That's how important it is. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Um, if anybody wants to grab these slides, they can get them from amherstschooltalk.org slash node slash 116. Creativity, arts, and money. The good jobs of today require workers to have not just knowledge, but also creativity. Uh, Stan understands this very well. As he points out that their employers are increasingly wanting uh, employees that, who are creative and who can generate new ideas and new ways of solving problems. And also that creativity isn't just about art. Uh, creativity is needed in jobs besides just uh, artistic jobs as well. <coughs> as an extreme example of that, maybe, for those of you who admire Apple products, um, this guy's creativity and the creativity of his team is the reason why Apple products are what they are. Um, certainly Johnny Ive has the knowledge and intelligence to do his job, but it's really his creativity and the creativity of his team that makes Apple products shine. Not to leave Microsoft out of the mix, but uh, Bill Gates said that creativity and intelligence are needed to make the world a better place. Um, so he recognizes the importance of creativity and not just raw intelligence. I was browsing um, TED conference talks. Uh, for those who don't know, TED stands for Technology, Education, Design, and if you go to TED.com, you'll find some great talks there. And I came across this one by Ken Robinson, who says schools kill creativity. He says we've been educated to become good workers rather than creative thinkers. We are educating people out of their creativity. His contention is that creativity now is as important as education as, education as literacy. But why the arts? Um, certainly creativity can be taught in math and science. They should and, and, and are taught in math and science. But it's in the arts where creative juices really get flowing. The way I like to think about it is a second grader with a blank piece of paper and a box of crayons. That's just raw creativity when they're working. And I think as we get older and as students progress, they lose that ability to look at a blank piece of paper and figure out what to do with it. And it's not just in the arts where you face blank pieces of paper. Um, an engineer, if they have to design a computer or build a bridge, it's a blank piece of paper they're looking at. And so to be able to think creati creatively about how am I gonna deal with that blank piece of paper is a real skill that, uh, that I know employers want big time. But can the arts help overall in education? You know, does it help boost the overall performance of students in schools. Uh, for those who don't know, Finland has the top performing students in the world. And um, they happen to also spend more in arts and education than any other country. I put this up here because this is how they fund their education. And note that central government covers 52% of it and, and local government only 30%. So remember that as we move along here. Money. Another TED talk that was recent, uh, just in February, Bill Gates talked about how state budgets are breaking U.S. schools. He talked mainly about California, but he said pretty much all states have this problem where there's an increasingly difficult picture they're facing, uh, much of it because of long-term liabilities that are unfunded. And he talked about in California, if to fully fund future healthcare liabilities, they would have to cut the education budget in half. So as that 
that problem grows, there's going to be more and more of a squeeze on the education budget, unfortunately. His uh, suggestion about how to fix that is more education about state budgets, better accounting so that future liabilities are not hidden like they are now, and to reward politicians when they are honest about these long-term problems. He thinks this is a solvable problem, but I worry a bit about that third thing there where I'm not sure where we are rewarding politicians about it being honest about long-term problems. Um, so now let's look at our numbers here that you can find at amherst.gov slash budget. You've probably mostly seen this before, but most of uh, our revenue comes from property taxes um, and state aid has been shrinking. That was 21% of our budget in fiscal year 11. And it was in for, I'm sorry, and it was 27% um, in 2002. And you've probably mostly seen this before too. Schools account for about 53% of our budget. Uh, this is the one I mainly want to focus on. You can see the roller coaster ride that uh, state aid goes on. It goes up and down all over the place. Um, that makes it hard to, to plan, but the worst part about it is that overall it's dropped. So if you look at uh, 2011 compared to 2001, it's dropped about $700,000 in real dollars and about three and a half million adjusted for inflation. So that's, um, we could really use at least even half of that three and a half million right now, but we don't have it. And um, more, as you all know, more and more of a squeeze has been put on local funding and um, as state funding has shrunk has decreased. So in conclusion, uh, to have creative students, we need the arts. To have arts, we need money. Um, local funding carries too much of the burden for education and it's getting worse. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any political will to raise or restore state or federal revenue to correct this. And can this change? If so, how? I'm not sure I know how. Um, but in the meantime, as we grapple with this, uh, we have to remember what Bill Gates and others said, that creativity is as important as intelligence, and the arts are critical to teaching our kids creativity. So we need to remember that as we try to use the limited funds we have in figuring out where to spend those funds. Thank you. Okay, so if you have a question for Stan, if you raise your hand, then Rebecca will come over with the microphone so you can uh, be heard. <laughs> Can you talk 
talk a bit more about the index? Creativity index. the name of it. Yeah, creative index. And it, I, so I'm a little leery of committees or studies, so if you could just talk a little more about that. Yeah, I mean, there, there isn't too much more that I can say about it. Um, this is going to be a committee comprised of a combination of um, uh, teachers, uh, administrators in, in education, academics, and uh, we hope uh, other folks like this community uh, um, and others who can contribute to the conversation. And since it's not ever actually uh, taking place as far as we know, um, we're going by the seat of our pants and just starting this uh, from scratch. We, the Senate President appointed her people a long time ago, the speaker is working on his appointments and the governor, and we hope to have it up and running soon, but I, it's new. I'm not actually even going to be on the commission, um, but there are several people that, um, I got probably 30 people wrote to me, and I uh, nominated all of them, and several of them, several of them passed through the screen and got nominated already, appointed already, and I think there may be a couple of others who get appointed um, for one or the other, appointing for it. Oh yeah, not that I know of, but I will try to. Is that going to affect you? Is that okay? I have a question for Senator Russell. It doesn't. Is it on? Do you see any initiatives at the federal level possibly to provide uh, money for uh, arms education in uh, the public schools? Uh, I was recently in Washington with the Kennedy Center and, uh, and on another day meeting with congressional leaders uh, and uh, at this point, I do not see any significant appetite. The National Endowment for the Arts might come up with something, but that would be a sort of competitive grant type of thing. There, there does not appear to be any uh, organized program that I'm aware of in the U.S. Department of Education or an effort to create uh, such through the Department of Education. Creativity index is actually measuring creativity in a community, or you know, can you elaborate a little bit on yeah, what that looks like? Or? Yeah, as we conceptualize it, it is about creativity in the schools, how it's being taught, what's being taught, what are the elements of creativity that get taught and can be learned and shared, and then the best practices for doing all of that. But it's focused on. Uh, public education and in the school, in the classroom, and, and let's just say in the school, which can be the classroom, it can be the band, it can be, you know, uh, after school programs, etc. There's a gentleman down here. Can you talk about funding, you know, longer term, because the curves that Rick showed for state funding are pretty yeah the, yeah, the interesting thing is that um, what that shows, if you, would, if you would go 10 years before, what you'd have seen was a dramatic ramp up of state support for public education. We doubled statewide, not just, you know, not for any particular school district, but statewide we doubled Chapter 70 funding over a 10 year period. We kept the education reform promise of basically doubling funding and then after that, under the statute, we were obligated to do uh, basically inflation. And in any year in which we could do more than inflation, we did it. And some years we did it by bumping up above inflation, and other years um, on the base. And in other years, we added $25 or $50 per pupil in addition, uh, straight across the board. Um, but it, it's basically that last decade where we've had two recessions in that decade beginning of that decade and now, and now, basically we've seen a dramatic uh, reduction. Uh, on average, Americans, through their state governments, pay about 50% of the cost of education. Some states go as high as 70 to 80%, but on average it's 50%. In all of the years that I've been in the legislature, the closest we got was 48%. And we're now back down into the 30s. 
<clears throat> so we need another multi-year commitment for increased funding. The difficulty is that healthcare, as Mr. Gates and others were pointing out in the presentation there, uh, it's basically, the, the, it's, it's absorbing the majority of the growth in state revenues. And um, as, as example, when I chaired the Senate Ways and Means Committee about a decade ago, we were at about 22% of the state budget was healthcare. Now we're in excess of 40%. And depending upon what you count, we can actually be at close to 50%. And so basically, healthcare is absorbing the lion's share of our resources at the state level, and that's crowding out everything else in the budget. The second largest area of spending is actually uh, age municipalities. And it's getting in the 20 to 25 percent range when things are good. It's a little bit lower right now. But if you, um, uh, if you count uh, against state revenue, it's in excess of 40 percent of all state revenue is going to education and in the 20 percent range uh, in terms of total state spending. So it, this is a real challenge to figure out a scenario and a strategy for bumping up education spending again. And that does not include, by the way, the cost of schools. And we've built or renovated some six, 700 schools in the Commonwealth over the last 20 years. And that absorbs another billion dollars a year in state spending, almost a billion dollars a year in state spending. Um, I'm wondering how we can advocate for the arts. Who, who, who do we talk to? Who do we write to? What do we do? Well, I think there's two jobs to be done. One is the job in our communities of, of helping everybody from our neighbors and business leaders and, and everybody to understand uh, the value of the arts, how it fits in, and, and that it should not be seen as a frill or an add-on or something that's done at the end of the budget if there's a few dollars left. And the second is that I, I think that uh, you all collectively need to uh, continue to push the, the legislature. Only in the last decade have we actually created a committee. Well, 15 years ago, we created, we took the Education Committee and made it the Committee on Education, Arts, and Humanities. That didn't do enough. We've now created a Committee on Tourism, Arts, and Culture. And actually, we've had more success by combining it with the business community's interests than we had when it was seen as an element in education. And uh, we've had four, maybe five major initiatives in the arts overall in the last decade. They all got done through economic development bills, not through education bills. So connecting with the economy, with the business community, and making this connection and helping them understand not only the intrinsic value of the arts, but also the connection to a healthy economy, to a healthy democracy, to a healthy community is also extremely important. And I'm glad to hear that you're going to uh, the advocacy uh, workshop at your, at your conference. And that was the reason I was at the Kennedy Center. We're working on a national program to try to build arts education advocacy across this country by building community and state-based advocacy organizations for arts education. I think at this point we should take one more question for Stan and then let him go home and eat dinner. So one more question. Uh, considering that the state is so uh, strapped for money, uh, is it a good idea to have the sales tax holidays this year and also the topic of spending it to include uh, restaurants? Or yeah, it's it's very that's a very difficult uh, problem because there is a net gain to the businesses, but there's a net reduction to the uh, to the general fund. And I think, if I'm remembering this correctly, the pattern is that it's being less and less productive for the businesses with each passing year. So the thing may burn itself out and. Uh, I'm not optimistic about it growing for the restaurant community, but I believe it will be presented to us. Um, but if we're not able to raise revenue, we should at least be trying to hold the line and maintain the revenue base that we have. But it is very difficult, and 
I'm guilty I voted for it in the past myself because you get 50-50. Half of your constituency that communicates with you is saying do it, and the other half doesn't. says so don't do it, and so it's really, it's, it's difficult. Well, thank you, and thank you for allowing me to come home. I haven't been home yet today, so <laughs> <laughs> I need dinner. Thank you. Thank you all. In terms of bringing things into the schools, we 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 have been bringing in. <coughs> pardon, pardon me. We have been bringing in assemblies. We we go through the mass um, mass arts cultural arts, council. mass arts cultural, cultural council. council. So we, so we are able to do that, um, but those those are just. Um, one one time performances, not to say any anything wrong with that. So, like um, at the middle school, the last couple of years, we have been bringing in um, um, Shakespeare and Company has has been coming in. Uh, we've had a couple of different um, a couple of different authors who have have come in. Um, last year, Janet Wu came in and met with the entire seventh grade. So we, we have been able to do things like that, and the English teachers and the social studies teachers uh, have been really good about building it into their, their curriculum. So we, we, are, we are able to do that. Um, I have worked with the um, other music teachers to bring in um, different, kind, different kinds of performances in, into the schools. Two, it's uh, a matter of with with some of the performances they need to have matching funds. So if we don't have the funds to match with them, we're not able to get them in. Some of them, some of them don't require that. So that's where, um, for instance, when when I when I wrote the grants this year, um, those. We were we were able I was able to bring those performers in without um, in part asking them if they would if they would take a reduced rate on what they would normally charge. So for instance, for instance, Evelyn Harris when she came in uh, in to sing, she took a fairly hefty cut in the fee that she normally gets for for a. Um, a school performance. Not all performers would, will do that. So it's kind of a, you know, and we worked with um, we worked with with, with with the fine arts center in, in the past. Yeah. Yes. Uh, like I mentioned in my talk, um, the fine arts center um, really 
try to, every time we bring a performer, we try to see if they can do things with these schools. So we, we look for sponsors, we look for money to be able to bring them to schools. And sometimes it's easier when you go to private school because there's more red tape to go through. Uh, public schools are a little difficult because uh, the teachers, they have to look for some way to subsidize the, to pay for the tickets, to pay for the bus, all that. But sometimes we get sponsors that uh, help with some of those expenses. Um, so I think also the teacher need to be motivated to really go and make a little more effort to really bring these students or to for us to get a performance over there at the school. Uh, things are available. Um, you just have to find a way to get them to do it. One of the things I think you hear a lot now is um, how much teachers have to be savvy fundraisers um, to put together that money that maybe a generation ago they would have just applied to get the, the funds um, through their own administration. Um, one of the things, in addition to being able to bring, say, students to the car, all those students to see a fine arts center performance, one of the things that's really valuable that we hear from the teachers, and that is we've been applying for grants, we haven't gotten one yet, we've been doing it this year in earnest, and even pairing up with some other nonprofits, figuring that maybe they'll like us better in pairs. Um, but we've been trying to figure out a way to get students to be able to come um, and participate in something here on a year-round basis. So it might be that they visit, but then we go back into the classroom once or twice a week, all the way through the school year. You can build a much more um, deep and enriching program. It, it has a lot of continuity for the students, and you can better integrate yourself into what else is happening in that classroom. Um, so we really love that idea that we could bring students here and also go back into the classroom on a sustained basis. Um, so we've got our fingers crossed, and, and it's very difficult right now because everything's, all, you know, all the things we depend on, like the NEA, are getting cut. But um, we, we hope that at some point something like that will surface. It's expensive for like the Fine Arts Center or the Carl to do something like that, but it's, it, we think, kind of the most valuable thing that we could do. And then um, every once in a while you kind, of, you kind of luck out. For instance, this year the middle school, middle school chorus um, what was honored, we, we were chosen as one of three middle school choruses in the United States to take part in a program called the, the American Composers Forum. And uh, we found this out over the summer. And we were paired up with an American composer, composer by the name of Alice Parker. And Alice has been, has been working with us throughout the school year as a compo composer in, in, composer in, um, in residence. And, um, as part of the program, she she's composing composing a new work that we will that, that will be that will be premiering at the end of the uh, end of the school year. So every once in a while, you, you, you kind of fall into a um, fall into a program like that. That, um, that that's pretty neat to do. Keep the arts alive in our schools. Thank you so much.